so, um, today uh, the topic is cyber defense, but if you allow me, um, then I would uh, maybe start uh, uh, from a more um, philosophical notion of uh, what actually is cyberspace and how exactly we should treat this new domain. Um, cyberspace is something very new for all of us, uh, for the governments especially, and for the policymakers in the governments especially. Uh, it has been a very technical domain. Uh, there is a good uh, experience around amongst the technical communities. And I see many practitioners in the room, and I'm very glad that we have more and more practitioners also becoming policymakers in this field. But uh, as a public policymaker for almost 20 years, uh, I see quite interesting similarities with other new fields in cyber because we lack institutions domestically in cyber as we lacked them possibly in some other areas before. And we also lack the proper coordination quite often domestically when we try to put together our cyber projects nationally. And then we lack skilled people. Uh, we lack good training programs. Uh, and then we lack awareness. So uh, I think these are the major topics we all have to work hard and that will make, in the end, our cyber, um, let's say, future or, or our cyber project much uh, more resilient. Uh, because we cannot really speak about the defense in uh, traditional terms when we speak about cyber issues. Uh, uh, cyber, as such, is a very um, non-state concept. It's IT technology, uh, uh, innovate, innovation by the private sector and uh, civil society enthusiasm that has gone into Internet in the last decades. So this is a very anti-government concept. Governments um, are not easy to deal with these kind of uh, asymmetric uh, networking uh, type of new entities because the governments are more hierarchical. Governments rely on a certain procedures and processes and, and cyberspace is something new for the governments. Therefore, the policy response is that we have to choose, have to be a little different than we are uh, uh, used to uh, in more traditional areas, especially when it comes to national security and defense. So, um, I would say that uh, what we need to do in cyberspace in order to make it more resilient or defend our uh, organizations, um, our computers, our information systems, is to enhance the capacities at different levels. So, when we talk about the national level, then we need a very strong uh, bottom uh, part of the pyramid, which is the civilian, non-state, strong cyber resilience capacities. Uh, it's 80% of private sector that runs our businesses, and we know that um, no, none of the governments is powerful enough to tell a majority uh, of the critical providers what exactly should be done locally in order to protect the critical services running. So. This has to be public-private partnership, and it has to be um, a project that involves all the private actors. Then, um, also, cyberspace is not hierarchical. Cyberspace is a network. In order to have a good resilience structure, a good crisis management structure, a good defense strategy, we have to start thinking as a network. It's network against network. It's not the network against hierarchy, because I'm very sorry, but hierarchy will lose. And, and this is something that we learned in 2007 in Estonia, that um, this was the network of non-state actors that helped to fend off the attacks. It, it was not a government agency. Uh, it was not one organization in a country. It was a network of different organizations that coordinated. And, and that's how they could uh, resist for three, three weeks of uh, serious uh, DDoS attacks. So, when it comes to a um, more policy response, what we have seen so far, then I think the European Union provides a very interesting example of m different, very resilient national governmental cyber models. Um, we can see at least three or four different models now emerging in, inside of the European Union by the different regions, different countries there. Um, and in the end, every nation in the world has to find its own cyber model to become more defended and more resilient in this space. Um, what we have in the EU right now, we can um, observe the Nord Nordic um, strong voluntary public-private partnership cooperation model. 
which also uh, is possibly uh, enhanced by the f cultural, institutional and organizational traditions of, uh, of Nordic nations, where I think Estonia belongs to, because we have had uh, almost 1,000 years of, of the certain culture of uh, uh, holding the society together. And, and this has helped us now to define ourselves also in cyber area. Um, then we have a more intelligence-led uh, gentleman agreement model, which is the UK model, where uh, certain um, entities have good cooperation, coordination, and, and agreements already that back to, uh, this uh, coordination uh, dates back to Cold War times, when the critical infrastructure was important. And now this has uh, been extended to cyber issues. Then we have a third model, which is more um, top-down regulatory model. Um, this more dirigist model uh, possibly is the continental European, central European, um, or um, sometimes people say more French model, but I don't think that we should associate this with one country. So uh, they, there you could see the feel that we should regulate, we should tell the private sector what to do and how exactly to do it. Uh, so these kind of tendencies you see uh, as well. So, um, as you know, the uh, EU proposal for cyber directive is still in the European Parliament right now and the policymakers are um, still deciding what kind of model and how and when uh, this EU legislation will come out. So, um, what this legislation possibly should achieve is a little more unified cyber resilience across the European Union because we have quite big differences between different regions and between different countries in the EU right now. So, to wrap up the national part of my presentation, and before I start with some comments on international part, I would say that when it comes to national defense and national security, then the successful national cyber defense model is always also a multi-stakeholder model. It has to be civilian military cooperation that it is based on, it should have involvement of the private sector. It should have the uh, support from broad civilian base. And uh, possibly the best uh, uh, advice would be to have good national exercise with all different national agencies and um, organizations involved and start doing it as often as possible in cyber. And then your model comes together. So if you are looking for advice in this national part. Um, the second very important part uh, to make cyberspace more stable is to have a good international cyber policy. Uh, in cyberspace, what we have seen um, in last decades is still, uh, it's, a, it's a baby policy area, I would call it. Um, it's not comparable even with more traditional um, international policies where we know what to do. Uh, we have some sort of agreements between the governments we have the clear understanding of, of the behavior of the biggest actors. In cyber, we just are doing the first steps. And um, so it's good, very um, glad news that to, yesterday night, actually, there was a very important set um, of cyber norms agreed at the um, uh, OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, on what exactly the countries are supposed to be doing in cyberspace. So we have the first set of cyber norms now agreed by almost 50 countries, or participating states as they call themselves there. So uh, I think this is a very uh, great achievement, and uh, I'm very glad that, uh, that this happened. It's going to be a very good model globally, because OSCE, as we know, has a large number of countries, and we hope that the same um, uh, cyber norms approach will be taken also by other important regional security organizations like ASEAN Regional Forum and where China also is so part um, and, and this is uh, uh, a big win for the diplomatic community internationally that we have the first set of cyber norms now agreed. What is this set of cyber norms? What exactly the states then agreed? They now agreed that they start talking on cyber business to each other officially because so far it has happened between some of the partners, sometimes, uh, uh, with some success uh, in some cases, but there is no good um, model or no good idea how exactly we should carry out this kind of 
cyber information exchanges, or what should we do when cyber crisis hits us? Who should we call in another country if we want to? So everything we have had so far was uh, basically informal. Now there is a first form, a little more formalized uh, norm agreed between the countries. So, and uh, it's still political military field, but uh, hopefully the uh, norms, the cyber norms, will at some point also involve more multi-stakeholder community. So the second step that we uh, need to do internationally is to make sure that the rule of law and uh, the existing laws, not new laws, apply in cyberspace. There are some calls for new treaties and new laws for now and sometimes in bigger international um, organizations. And um, we, the cyber people, don't think that new laws can fix cyberspace. We have to apply the existing ones. We have the Budapest Convention for Cybercrime um, to address uh, problems related to criminal activities in cyberspace. We have the international humanitarian law that uh, uh, has set a very um, long time ago the principles of um, uh, guiding or of, of behavior of the states during the conflicts. So this just has to apply now to cyberspace because it really doesn't matter how do I hit you. I need to follow the same moral principles, right? So, um, and then we have the other international laws like human rights uh, um, laws and others that should also apply in cyberspace. So, um, as was mentioned already before by our US colleague, we need to keep um, uh, internet free and open. And this has uh, uh, been a big debate during last year, how exactly we do it, and we possibly need a little better coordination between the like-minded countries and also not so like-minded countries to convince that the current model where the private sector is in the lead is exactly what we need for the future innovation and economic growth. And, um, and uh, this is our, let's say, big goal for the next coming years. And how we, how we actually convince the countries that are just very uh, poor or not very resourceful in technology field or feel that they are on the different side of the digital divide so I think what we really have to now concentrate on is the capacity building. And to find the right way to do it is also very important. Uh, maybe we should start asking the countries that are still in the beginning of their technology development what exactly should be done uh, to help them and, and how to make it more resilient already from the outset. Because uh, they should not repeat our mistakes that we put all the systems up and now we start securing them. Uh, maybe, maybe it's possible for them to have a little more resilience elements already in before they develop those systems. And capacity building is one of the areas which is uh, possibly the biggest priority for the EU uh, external action service because um, development aid is our uh, traditional niche. We have earmarked uh, some funds for the next uh, five years for this project and we are going to find the uh, model that works for us in the European Union, and of course we should coordinate this globally with our uh, partners. Um, so how we actually can bring together the development community and cyber community is still a question. The second question is to actually have a good understanding on the priorities in, uh, in third countries, what should be achieved there. And also the question would be how private sector would factor into this project. So um, we try to organize a series of um, workshops and events to answer this question in, in next year and this will be our absolute priority to make cyberspace much more secure. Thank you. <laughs>